to reduce vehicle trips and parking. Um, these are things that we've seen in our area evolve over the last uh, 10, 20 years or so. And this really started, and the most familiar examples are large workplaces. Um, one of the stellar and shining examples in our area is Stanford University. Um, where Stanford, um, in uh, 2000, the county of Santa Clara, um, they wanted to grow and add buildings and add students, and the county said, great, go to town, bring more people in as long as you do not add even one single new car trip. And they grumbled and complained, and then eventually they said, okay, and here's what they did. So in 2002, they started out with 72% of their uh, employees driving. These are grown-up employees, not grad students, not undergrads, adult employees, 72% were driving to work, which is pretty common in the area. And where they were in 2013, on the last year for which we have full numbers, was 42%. So they have really dramatically reduced um, the amount of driving over that time, and um, you know, including using uh, Caltrain, carpools, van pools, um, uh, bicycling, and um, uh, uh, really uh, getting a lot of change. And when you look at the change that happened, if you look at that uh, red number that goes all the way up and uh, to the right, I hope we don't in injure any of the panelists from <coughs> looking at this, um, but you can see that the number of people has gone up, um, but that um, uh, red line uh, down there um, when it is um, the number of parking permits, the amount of parking used actually went down, even as the number of people went up by 25 to 30%. And Stanford tells us that they have saved $100 million in parking structures they did not need to build um, by doing incentives um, to, uh, uh, to reduce uh, driving. Um, and from a, a sustainability perspective, um, we didn't ha just see carbon emissions go down per person. Carbon emissions went down on an absolute basis. Um, so this is good from a traffic perspective, a parking perspective, and an environmental sustainability perspective. I'm not going to go into the Stanford case study and how they did it. Um, we'll hear some other case studies, and if Stanford comes up in the questions, I can share a little bit more about uh, what they do. Um, uh, one thing, so a trend that we're starting to see is that this is, pertains not only to big employers anymore, um, but um, also pertains to cities, where cities are starting to develop strategies to uh, reduce traffic and parking challenges. Um, so one of the concerns that people have is, okay, the city is going to do this, we're going to have more people come in. You know, why should I believe this is going to happen? You know, is this really going to work? And the city of San Mateo, which is one of the cities that is pursuing one of these uh, strategies, is um, doing this, this spreadsheet, which you probably cannot read, and you know, you, just wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to read it anyway. And it looks inc incredibly geeky and dull and boring. And this is one of the most exciting things that's happening in our region right now. <laughs> um, because what that does, um, uh, what, what, what this is, is it saying in the rail corridor, in San Mateo, from Hayward Park to Hillsdale Station, these are developments. Um, these are the number of car trips that they are allowed to have. And every year, they need to report to city council in this spreadsheet saying have they achieved their goal or have they not achieved their goal. And they have a menu of things that they can do, starting with the easy ones. And if they are not achieving their goal, they need to put uh, more money in and do more work to be able to achieve the goal and this is transparent, this is up on their website. So this is not just about promises, it's about reporting and it's about accountability and hopefully we'll hear some more about how that is being done in um, other locations as well. And this is, as I mentioned, this is a regional trend. Um, we're going from individual projects and individual developments to some cities setting up transportation management associations. Um, these are nonprofit organizations typically that will manage a program to reduce vehicle trips using techniques like having uh, discount transit passes, shuttles, carpool programs, and programs, getting money from 
sources including employers, developments, parking revenues, um, uh, uh, grants, and being able to aggregate this funding to provide the programs, not just for you know, Google or Stanford and the one biggest <coughs> employer, um, but for areas, for downtowns, for change areas, so that you can set goals and measure and manage and see that we're going to achieve this goal. So that's the big picture trend. Um, I'd like to uh, turn the microphone over to uh, Trudy Ryan with the city of Sunnyvale, um, which has really been a leader in this area for quite some time. We can talk about um, some of the uh, strategies and the policies and results. Lots of other this evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the city's planning officer, and I've um, worked for the city of Sunnyvale for 25 years. And over 25 years, I've seen a lot of changes, um, a, lot of, a lot of sameness, which the community likes, a lot of change, which the community likes, and a lot of sameness and change that members of the community don't like. <laughs> so, you know, that's what planning is all about. Uh, let me get the right, uh, right presentation. I do want to acknowledge uh, Nora Kami Valepe and Rosemary Zuleta, associate planners for the city of Sunnyvale, who helped me brainstorm and put the ideas together on this uh, presentation. <laughs> <laughs> is, How did you do? <laughs> um, and I also wanted to mention that um, in preparation of the of the of this um, uh, talk, I I send an email message out to a number of developers and businesses and TVM specialists, we'll find out what TVM is in a second, and um, ask them to provide me some information. So Elizabeth Hughes, who um, I think her title of the firm is something like TVM Solutions or TVM Specialist, and Jane Beerstadt with Fair Peers, um, both of whom have been in the TVM world for a while. They, they helped me get some, some of the ideas together just to be able to uh, demonstrate a little bit better for you. Um, so I'm going to talk about what is TVM, uh, some of the policies that Sunnyvale has. Um, speak specifically about the Moffat Park um, area of Sunnyvale, which is a business park. Our green building program, what we do with conditions of approval when the development applications come, and um, just a little bit of information about our design guidelines. So TVM, what is it? Well, it stands for Transportation Demand Management. And it's, uh, these are the policies to reduce travel demand or to redistribute um, to other types of travel of uh, space and time. So here's the joke. Uh, it's not TDM, it's TDN. And that came from the um, city of Victoria. Um, and these are just some images of various the different resources that are out there for folks that are interested in learning about transportation and management or in changing their travel um, behavior. Is it cars, Caltrain, uh, 5.1.org. Um, so I came up with the five W's, um, who, who does TVM, and oftentimes cities do that um, as a regulatory tool, um, employers, uh, maybe re residents do it on their own every time you make a, a decision about how to travel, you're, you're somehow rather involved in, in your demand management, you may be demanding a lot of single occupant um, vehicle for your travel, or you may do, be demanding different kinds of public uh, transportation to assist you. Um, so what we already said is to redistribute or reduce the amount of travel in the single occupant vehicle, um, either by changing things from off the peak hour or, or all day long. Um, and it can happen at a destination or origin. It's any, any part of your trip um, throughout the day can be a uh, subject of, of the demand management. And why do we do it? Uh, who cares if everybody drives in their own car? Well, there's congestion, which takes us more time, and that's costly to us as a society. Um, but also, um, it improves air quality to have fewer vehicles out there. And even though you might have an electric vehicle, you're, you're causing some different travel we have, have patterns because you're another vehicle on the road, and that can slow things down. So transportation demand management is, is looking at ways to not build facilities and structures to, to get yourself out of the congestion game. And so how? That's, that's what the next part is. Um, there's a principle in smart growth called the four Ds. And so 
a lot of times when people think of transportation demand management, they, they really think about the programs. Oh, that I have a bus pass. That's transportation demand management. But that's, that's really only one component. You, you, you need to think about having higher intensive uses in certain places um, to, to capture um, and, and make more efficient some of the travel options. Um, you need to provide varieties of the land use in close proximity to each other to give um, uh, individuals choices about when and how to get places. You need to look at the design. How does the building relate to the sidewalk? How does the bicycle facilities, um, how do they uh, um, uh, mesh up with other transportation options? And then obviously looking at your destinations um, for you know, the total vehicle miles traveled with MT, a lot of acronyms. And, um, and the goal of fewer automobile trips. Um, Somerville has what we call a TDM toolkit, which was provided to us by one of our, um, one of our businesses that got permission to build higher uh, floor area ratio. That's just a measurement of the size of the building relative to the size of the land. And in, this, in the 80s, Sunnyvale committed to a 35% floor area ratio to get a better balance between jobs and housing. Um, and, and now some of that, that's the change, some of the thinking that's changing is um, maybe higher intensity unit, uh, uses in some of the flatter areas of the Bay Area and, and lower intensity uses in the more sensitive habitat areas. Maybe that's desirable and we need to think about this from a regional perspective. So a developer came in in the, in the late 90s and um, one of the things they offered was to pay for their consultant to prepare this toolkit. So we have this document. We need to get that on the um, see, this is why they're really here, so I think it's something fun to do. <laughs> um, but you really need to look at the site and buildings it designed, as I talked about. It has information about that. It, it's, a, it's a pretty thick document. Um, it looks at programs and resources that you'll need for an effective program. Um, you need to have goals and targets. Why are you doing this? How do you know if you're successful? Um, you need to have a good plan for implementing it, and there are a number of different recommendations. Um, in the toolkit, and then you should monitor and evaluate. Um, we're, you know, you're doing something, and everybody likes it, but it's really only reducing one automobile trip. Is it really that effective? And then, um, you know, you need a you need a little bit of a stick. There might need to be some penalties uh, for not compliance. You know, unless voluntarily you're doing that and you decide, hey, we just don't want to do it. I guess that's your penalty. You don't you don't get the the, the earth benefit from that. So what makes a successful TVM program? Um, site locations near rail stations tend to be the most successful. Um, you can move a lot of people. Of course, there has to be a place on the other end that they want to go to. Um, financial incentives, um, you know, paying people not to bring their automobile, paying them to oh, a minute. Um, parking restrictions uh, um, and cost of parking and private shuttle buses tend to be the most effective tools. Um, and lack of outreach, uh, lack of funding, um, lack of enforcement, um, and, and lack of someone to help implement the program. Um, those don't contribute well. I'm not going to go through these. These are a number of different ways that we've addressed smart growth and uh, transportation and management. Um, the Moffat Park specific plan has mandatory um, TDM requirements, 30% peak hour, 25% total. There is the Moffitt Park Business Group, which is a voluntary organization which is to help their members um, meet their TV and targets. It is totally voluntary. And then um, we have a green building program that says if you want extra, she took one. <laughs> I just have three more slides. Okay. So, um, so if you want extra um, development, you have to reduce your trips so you're the same as if you hadn't had the development. So um, that's built in both Moffat Park and Citywide. Um, and then conditions of approval, we look for some of those design features and how can we um, extend our, our bicycle system, extend the sidewalk system. So we're not just talking about vehicle moving, uh, like moving people around, we're also talking about how we move ourselves um, a, a little less uh, uh, technology. And then um, lastly, we do have traffic impact fees that don't just pay for um, improvements in the roadways, but they also look at um, in, in, um, sidewalks and, and things of uh, bicycles and sidewalks and things of that nature. And then our design guidelines will also interface uh, as we do new projects. Number of plans? Who's number three?
Sunnyvale Cool. Um, my name is Martin Alcar. I work with the City of Mountain View Planning. Um, before I get started, I would um, like to acknowledge uh, a few people. Uh, first, Jim Lightbody in the back. Um, Jim, you could raise your hand. Uh, I've been working with Jim on this project for a couple years, um, uh, so it's been uh, great. And, um, any hard questions, send to him. So, so I'm going to talk about um, the North Bay Shore Precise Plan. Um, and uh, the public draft is out now, and we hope to bring it to adoption uh, later this year. Just to give you a little bit of quick background, most people know where North Bay Shore is, but I just thought I'd bring this slide. Um, here you have uh, the North Bay Shore. Uh, it's basically an office uh, business park, a lot of standalone office buildings surrounded by surface parking. Of course, you have San Francisco Bay up here, Highway 101, Powell Walk over here, and Moffett Field uh, over there. Um, it is an area notable for uh, the Shoreline Amphitheater and Shoreline Park. I don't know how that picture of Neil Young got up there, but um, <laughs> in any event. Um, so the precise plan that, um, and this is also home to, of course, many uh, corporations that you've seen here. Um, the precise plan has many priorities and topics, but I'm just going to talk about these three tonight. Um, land use transportation, uh, TDM policies and programs, uh, and, and then that'll be it. Um, just as a quick overview, first I'll talk about uh, land use. Um, this is a conceptual uh, sketch of our general plan, which was adopted in 2012, and this really provided the um, vision and guiding principles for uh, the precise plan work that we're doing right now. Um, it did call to add three and a half, about three and a half million square feet of um, office, and its vision was to pull uh, the buildings closer to the street, and have a transit boulevard down here, and really try to break up the uh, big blocks that are out there. So what the precise plan is doing is taking that concept and creating a land use plan. <clears throat> and we're doing that uh, by the use of what we're calling character areas. So we have four character areas, and we're really trying to create some distinct uh, places out here. Uh, I'll just give you a quick overview. Um, the gateway area right here, uh, it's about 20 acres at 101 and Shoreline. It's going to be the most intense area um, in the plan. A lot of retail, entertainment, uh, hotel uses. And then the core area uh, around in this area, off of Shoreline, uh, a lot more pedestrian um, activity. Uh, again, buildings closer to the street, uh, retail services, restaurants, that kind of thing. And then in the general area, uh, the uh, orange area here, it's more of a traditional uh, office campus environment. And finally, the last character area, the edge area, uh, which is uh, along the edge of Shoreline Park and Stevens Creek and habitat areas, and that's the lowest intensity area where uh, we want to see a lot more landscaping as it transitions to the natural area. So, um, and we'll talk about these in detail, but basically, uh, the precise one has, it's a regulatory document, so it has uh, standards for building height and setbacks that we want to achieve in each of these character areas. Next, I'll talk about uh, transportation. Uh, this is a graphic showing uh, the new street network that we're uh, planning for in North Bay Shore. I just want to be clear, this is uh, a street network that's envisioned to uh, you know, occur over many decades, um, several decades. Um, and the way we're approaching this work is um, through uh, street types and basically organizing the streets out there into these street types that you see here, gateway boulevards, access streets, transit boulevards, and green streets. Um, this gives you an idea of the new streets that we're planning out in the North Bay Shore area. Um, the streets in gray are the existing streets, and these streets in yellow will be the new streets that we are going to create in order to help break up that grid uh, create a more coherent street network, uh, and then also add these new green streets uh, right here where we'll have more bike and pedestrian access throughout the area. 
Um, I'll give you an example of um, a project currently under construction that uh, demonstrates what the precise plan is trying to do in terms of creating a new uh, bike and ped uh, connection uh, through this area. Uh, from Alta Avenue to Shoreline, Google is currently building a bike and pedestrian only uh, street, what we're calling Greenway, the precise plan. Again, this is a key concept that we want to implement throughout the precise plan, and it's kind of exciting that this is under construction right now. Here's some pictures from yesterday. Uh, again, it's nearing completion. It's going to be a bike only uh, connection. Uh, the tan area here is a pedestrian uh, connection. It's, it has high quality uh, public uh, crossing uh, symbols, a bike and head right here to make it uh, real easy. Uh, safety signs, uh, of course the uh, drought tolerant uh, native landscaping, some high quality uh, light fixtures, of course uh, street furnishings, you never know that this is for Google, but um, those are the colors. <laughs> Oops, and then the last, this is the kind of their visualization of how this would look over time. Obviously it's, it's prettied up and everything, but the concept is the important thing that um, this area hopefully will transition into a, a campus feel environment and you would have these connections throughout North Bay Shore so people have options to get around without using their car. So the precise plan also will have uh, street sections in them. That is, how, how will each of these streets be designed? So here's a uh, street section of what we're calling the Gateway Boulevard. And the Gateway Boulevard is envisioned to uh, do two things. Uh, along Shoreline, carry uh, most of the uh, vehicle traffic through there. And you can see the two lanes here, the three lanes here. But we're also planning a uh, center dedicated lane, uh, bus, uh, bus service lane for high frequency bus. It could be public or private. Uh, and that would run down the gateway. And then also, I don't know if you can see it, but on either side have new cycle tracks on either side uh, going both ways. Again, make it easy to, for uh, people to get around uh, with other modes. So how do you marry these two things together, land use and transportation? Well, here's the uh, land use plan that I showed previously. Again, the most intense areas here along the shoreline, going along Charleston. And if you were to overlay kind of the plan for the transit, where we want to have the transit boulevard come down here and also along Charleston, uh, you can see these circles represent, uh, in the center would be potential uh, bus stops, and that those circles represent a five minute uh, radius walk from those bus stops. So uh, you imagine that uh, that, could, that touches a lot of uh, properties out there. And if you double the size of those radiuses to uh, a 10 minute radius, it, it literally touches every parcel. So last I'll talk about TDM policies. How much time do I have? Uh, one minute. Oh, one minute, okay. So, uh, anyways, um, no, you've seen the headlines about traffic and whatnot, and, um, you know, all this traffic and how is it going to, how is the city going to grow and take care of this traffic issue? And here's an example of commute traffic coming into Mount View in the morning. Uh, it's back up all the way past uh, Middlefield Road. This is going over 101 into North Bay Shore. Uh, it's, it's a concern for everyone. Um, and the reason that it's a uh, congestion is a huge issue. There's only three ways into uh, the North Bay Shore area. So basically, you have a giant cul de sac, uh, unless you know Google brings in some ferries or something like that way. But uh, it is a giant cul de sac. So, real quickly, um, these are the three layer uh, strategies that we have to deal with this. The plan is trying to uh, or will adopt a, a very ambitious 45% uh, single occupancy vehicle target. So, new trips coming into uh, the district, 45% uh, um, the target is for single occupants vehicles. It sounds like it's a very ambitious number, and it is, but right now the district is about 52%, Jim, is that right? Uh, the typical American suburb, suburban office di district is like 80 or 90%, so we're doing really well already. But um, we do want to uh, introduce uh, a three-layer strategy. Number one, TDM programs to do things like Trudy just mentioned. Uh, we want to establish a trip cap to cap the number of vehicles that can go in to those three arrow uh, gateways there and have annual monitoring. Uh, if you go over that capacity, uh, the city can restrict or delay development. Um, that's not an adopted uh, 
program. It's just an idea that will go, a policy framework that will go into the precise plan. And if the city council wants to adopt that, they could later. Uh, and if you are not familiar with the congestion pricing, uh, it's basically charging folks to come into an area um, uh, and to hopefully influence their behavior to, to take other modes of transit. So if you're going, going across the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, here's Marin. If you go inside, uh, go across the bridge, uh, you know, they have a camera that'll take a picture of your vehicle and you'll get a bill uh, in the mail uh, and the technology is already there, so something like that could be done. Um, <clears throat> I got this bill and I told them I was doing this for research, but they still have to pay it, so <laughs> whatever. Um, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. So while transitioning to the next uh, speaker, um, you mentioned something that um, was uh, pretty important. I want to uh, call it out. So you talked about um, uh, setting this goal to reduce trips. And then you talked about um, breaking up the street grid. Um, tell me, uh, tell us how these things are related while I bring up the next slides. Uh, I'm sorry, how do you? Um, so what's the relationship between having a goal for the number of car trips and um, having a more fine-grained street grid with smaller blocks? How do those two different things relate to each other? <clears throat> well, um, the, the internal uh, plan that we have for the, the, the North Bay Shore, uh, the, the streets that I showed breaking up, it's really about getting uh, uh, people around in that area on bikes and cars. Um, the gateway capacity issue is, is cars coming into the area, and we're trying to address that through uh, a trip cap and potentially congestion pricing. So um, they're somewhat, if I understand your question, they're a little bit different, but um, there is some relation that relationship there. Okay, so so, so if you're if you're coming in um, without a car and you're trying to get to your next, well, what, you know, why do you have a car to begin with? Because you need to get around. So if you have smaller blocks and it's easier to walk around, you're more likely to not need a car to begin with because it's easier to walk and bike. You don't need a car to get to your next destination, which is a mile away. Um, and th that relationship between the details of land use and the transportation goals is, is something important that Mountain View is doing a great job with. And um, you know, hopefully, we're, we're seeing Sunnyvale going to with some of the plans that are going on. It. Now, now next, um, we've, we've heard about uh, office development in North Bayshore. Um, Jim Oberdorfer from First Community Housing We'll talk about strategies for reducing parking and trips in residential uh, developments. So, uh, Jim, looking forward to learning about that. Jeff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Mike, maybe you're on. Yeah, I'm trying to get this uh, so <laughs> Maybe there's a switch on the microphone to get turned off. That's quite right. a little bit and talk about individual buildings. Uh, we're a nonprofit affordable housing developer and as you can see from the three slides on the first slide, all our projects are located on Ontario streets next to transit. And our priorities as a nonprofit developer, first of all, we own our buildings for 55 years, so we have a commitment to durability and longevity that many uh, market rate developers don't when they spend their buildings after five or eight or ten years. Uh, we also give free annual eco passes to all our tenants throughout Santa Clara uh, forever, as long as we have the eco pass program. We are the largest purchaser of eco passes, residential eco passes. Uh, so all our projects are transit oriented. And we're always trying to reduce parking demand because by reducing parking demand, we actually increase density and get more units on the site. 
Um, we also integrate special populations, particularly uh, developmentally disabled uh, young people and families, and I'll talk about why. And we specialize in urban infills where we are renting to people between 20 and 60 percent area median income. So this is all very low income. And also we're looking at affordable housing nationally as a leader in green transformation. So as I said, we're the largest purchaser of eco passes in Santa Clara County for residential passes. Uh, every three or four years we do a study of our properties to try to ascertain how many people are using the eco passes. Uh, based on that, we hired a transportation uh, firm, Hexagon, to do an analysis of our one bedroom senior projects and also our studios and SROs. And we're able, based on that parking analysis, to reduce the parking that is required uh, in San Jose now for studios to 0.42, where it used to be one and a half parking spaces per studio, and also to uh, one bedrooms down to 0.65. The city of San Jose has just reduced senior parking to 0.5, so it's even less. And that's one of the reasons you'll see more developers building senior apartments and studios right now, because the parking is less than family parking. Um, and also, we're parking special needs tenants at zero parking to about 0.55. And this is really important, and it's one of the ways that we not only integrate special needs tenants, but are able to build on very small sites because by reducing parking, we're increasing density. So a structured parking space costs about $50,000 as a concrete parking space. Uh, we run about $65,000 a year buying eco passes. So if we save one or two parking spaces a year from our planning entitlements, we've already made our money back. So the question really is why aren't more people doing this? Uh, it's not a very innovative thing. The math is pretty straightforward. Um, so the parking deductions for the EcoPass gets us really some projects built that we couldn't be uh, couldn't have built without it. Uh, and this is a picture also of our EcoPass program. Once a year, we have people sign up for EcoPasses, and uh, we have a very very high usage on our sites for EcoPasses. So Gish has, uh, in San Jose, it's across from the Gish um, transit stop, obviously. It's 35 family units on top of a 7-Eleven with below grade parking. And if it wasn't for the reduction we got for special needs and the eco passes, this project would not be buildable. So it's really important to realize that without that deduction, there'd be no building there right now. There'd be a one-story 7-Eleven, because 7-Eleven owned the property. So this is how key uh, these parking deductions can be to make projects happen, not only to reduce parking, but actually get projects built on small lots. This is a 0.45 acre site. Very difficult, it was a brownfield site, so we had to clean it before building on it. Um, so this is really important in the sense that by combining the transit-oriented development itself or transit adjacency with green building, with the deductions for the eco passes and with special needs tenants, we have kind of a synchronicity where now we're doing special needs tenants as up to 35% of all our properties throughout uh, Santa Clara County, San Mateo, and Santa Cruz counties. Uh, you may have seen this building if you uh, follow uh, the U.S. Green Building Council. It's become a poster child for the Lead for Homes program. It was the first lead build in the state of California. So some quick observations, and I'll go through these slowly because people are often confused about the issues, isn't it great to build near transit? Well, actually, it can be more expensive to build near transit. One of the reasons is that you have soundproofing requirements. So if you're near a light rail that's screeching and you have to have acoustic windows, it's really the deductions, again, in parking because of the transit adjacencies that allow us to spend more money building more durable buildings. So for instance, on Gish, which is the project you served just previously, we could have asked the city of San Jose to not make us put balconies in. And they would have allowed us to do that. And you'll see many projects along light rail and transit do not have balconies for that reason. But with small apartments, we really wanted these balconies. And we put soundproof glass in, and if you look closely, you can see that the uh, balconies are open on the south side, looking towards us, and they're closed on the side with the light rail, which means that not only do people get more ventilation and have extra square footage with these balconies, but it became a major design feature in the building near transit, and they're saying, well, it gets more expensive. Here's some of the reasons. 
There's also vibration and mechanical issues, there's <coughs> venting issues. You can't vent out to the transit because the air coming in may bring in pollutants. So you have to increase the amount of um, the filtering <coughs> your HVAC systems. So again, this is not to be negative. It's just to say that when people complain it costs more to build like this, it actually does. The benefits are only occurring if you get the deducts on the transit proximity. So for a long time, uh, we only got a 5, per ten, five to 10 percent deduct for being adjacent to transit. If we got more like 20, it would make a lot more sense. And now that we've proved from 12 years of having the EcoPass program that there's a significant drop in car ownership because of the EcoPass program, it's these kinds of studies that lead to help us work with planners to reduce the parking. Um, again, I talked about the synchronicity between special needs tenants, transit, and transit passes, and also because we're green buildings with the indoor air quality, it's really critical. Um, there's also a procession of track transit safety that's critical to transit use. We just did a TOD study and surveyed all of our properties in Santa Clara County, and what we found is that many of our tenants kept cars because in the evenings, if they worked in the evenings, there was a perception of lack of safety with VTA. They gladly use it on the weekends and daytime. So this isn't a criticism of VTA because this is a perception, but if there's a perception of lack of safety, people are not gonna use transit, and therefore they'll keep their cars and use the transit on the weekends and the daytime. For many low-income residents, especially seniors and those with special needs, they have no choice but to use transit. Absolutely no choice. A senior can save $2,000 a year by not having a car, so it's really critical. So uh, with that and those observations, uh, I'll turn it over to Anne. Yeah. <coughs> All right, um, thank you very much, and I wanted to, um, as we're uh, heading over to uh, Anne's material, call out a couple of things. Um, so uh, one thing um, has to do with the, um, the, the customer base um, uh, for, um, uh, for these um, developments. Um, one of the challenges we have in this area, the San Jose uh, metro area has the highest car ownership per household rate in the entire country. Um, and <laughs> seriously, it's 94% of households. And um, that leaves people, in, including uh, very low income people, carrying the cost of a car, which is a huge cost burden. And we also, given the price of real estate in our area, have some of the longest commutes in the country. Um, so uh, having this type of development helps people to have shorter commutes. Um, helps uh, you know carbon emissions and reduce pollution and with all of the concern that people have about well if we have high density housing will this cause a catastrophe in terms of traffic and parking the data is really starting to show um, that that's actually not the case and this can really reduce the those uh, demands which is my segue to Anne Chang uh, of Transform who's been doing some pioneering research to show um, what those uh, impacts and benefits are in terms of doing that transit-oriented development um, for housing and affordable housing. I'm really looking forward to this presentation. Thank okay. you. Good evening, everyone. Um, well, and, and Jeff didn't, I, I was looking for the Green Trip logo, but I get to do that part of the his brag show. Um, Jeff is who I call, a, First Community Housing is really uh, one of the original Green Trip developers. They've been doing uh, green ship certified concepts for a long time, so I will get into that. A quick show of hands, folks, folks who have heard of Transform. Okay, great. And then how about folks who have heard of green ship certification? Okay, so I will spend a little time talking about that and then the research um, agenda that, that has spawned and, uh, and hopefully a quick tour of our new database tool. So, um, so Transform, we're a nonprofit. We're based in Mostly in Oakland, but we got Chris Lepe, who's our South Bay uh, senior community planner, um, who's holding down the fort, and we come visit whenever we can. Um, and we've been doing basically transportation land use policy to support um, social equity and climate. And so Green Trip really, uh, the goal is to help 
transform these parking lots into uh, livable, walkable, vibrant communities that everybody can love and and essentially look forward to, to having nearby. And um, and just a quick reminder of why we're doing all this. It's it's not just because we love parking and getting rid of parking. It's really so we can have wonderful places to live. And of course, as you all know, the incredible housing crisis um, originating out of all the employment pressures in our Silicon Valley are super economic engines. We are just, you know, facing incredible challenges right now to accommodate and keep people uh, staying in their homes. And so, as I mentioned, Green Trip certification. So, Green Trip is basically our lead type certification for new development, focused on how green it is to get to new development. And then I'll talk about our research, a parking database. And all of this really is to support you all, so great applause to you all for coming out on a weeknight to learn about what all these cities are doing, how they're doing things, and really educating yourselves to participate in these conversations uh, meaningfully. So uh, I invite you to check all this information out on our website. It's greentrip.org if you have a chance. Um, we've got all the information there that you'll see and more. Um, and so Green Trip is basically um, we, we started with some fantastic advisors, and I'll go through um, the partners, as well as the, the strategies that we uh, essentially pre-approve, and some stories. Uh, we've got this great, again, list of, uh, to, from housing professionals to transportation folks, um, transit agencies, and experts and academics, all who have helped us get started back in 2009. And the concept, very simply, is just that um, this is actually a UC Berkeley professor, Cervera, who, who took a t prototypical development and applying the standard suburban 2.2 parking spaces, kind of what happens when you apply that and you get a whole quarter of an 800 unit development being occupied by parking space. And we really all believe that we can make much better use of that land by putting in more units and really, again, leveraging and right-sizing that parking um, by taking advantage of EcoPass in VTA or in SamTrans has now a way to go pass and we are seeing more and more transit agencies step up to provide this, um, essentially I call the, the Groupon or Costco discount of transit passes. It's so just essentially volume discounts and building them into projects. So Green Trip projects, we, we work with developers uh, to get things like 40 years of free car share membership, 40 years of discount passes, um, or unbundling parking. And depending on where you are from the suburban to urban spectrum, um, you, you do what works best for you. And if you're in the more urban areas, you do all of them. There's also parking maximums, and um, we also do traffic modeling. Um, and so in the past, we, we started with those main uh, criteria, and then we, we branched into with Jeff's um, participation into Green Trip certification for existing buildings, recognizing great projects. Portfolio is also, um, Jeff is shooting for and making sure all his projects will be Green Trip certified. And Zero Parking um, kind of premiered in Berkeley. I'll talk about that, and soon we'll bring, bring on Platinum. And so here's our project spread out throughout the region. Um, but our, actually, our first award was in, in um, San Jose at the, the Deardown Station area, just south of Ipoloni. But we've had slow progress to start, but over, over the years, as definitely as development pressure is increasing, more and more interest. And so cumulatively to date, this is the impact of our 15 certified projects so far with those transit passes, with the, you know, the location and the development type, applying all those Ds that Trudy talked about really um, modeling, using uh, uh, Air Resources Board developed models. Um, we're seeing great impacts. Uh-oh, and then, there we go. And then here's an example. So the developers work with us. We help them through the entitlement process. So actually, Mountain View, one of the first projects was the studios. And um, working with Jeff Oberder for Actually, Jeff is one of those developers that didn't need our help, really. He's just doing this at, uh, kind of uh, by, by uh, protocol. But once we get there, once, if it makes sense, we'll present this award to the developer in front of the council family, who is 4th Street Community 
uh, apartment residents, they cumulatively save three thousand dollars a year, and that's not a small amount of change. Um, this, what's great is about EcoPass students in high school and junior high, older kids are taking their younger siblings to school and, and excursions. Um, and here's the cumulative um, effect of, of uh, Jeff's great projects. You know, very concrete. You know, this is equivalent to one month's rent for some folks. And then in the Berkeley case study, so this is crazy Berkeley, but um, we did get to work with them to eliminate a whole parking garage underneath, right next to campus. Um, instead of doing a $2.3 million parking garage, we translated that into the best traffic reduction strategy package we've seen to date in a residential project, and very much learning from all the great pioneering work around um, employment, employer-related TDMs. Um, so, this project, they bought their own, they're planning to buy their own cars, equip them with get around, peer-to-peer -peer car sharing technology. Everybody's getting transit passes, at least two per unit for 40 years. All flavors of bike parking, underground, in unit, at grade, on street. Um, bike parking uh, tools, equipment, pedestrian trunks in every unit, and touch screens for transit info. And so this is the developer actually integrated their, um, our green trip into their uh, project marketing, and we're starting to see them that the, the market-based developers as well um, absorb this. So barriers to infill. Here's you know a number of ways that we're seeing is a, is is a challenge. Instead of having just one-off projects here and there, we ideally want to get into the codes. We want to get into the plans, and so working with these great city partners like um, San Jose, Vale, San Jose, Oakland, Mountain View, Walnut Creek, um, to to slowly chip away at this with. Great data. So onto the research portion of it. Um, so with our researchers, I'd say, so I, I'll just skip through quickly, but we're doing a number of things now, really, uh, in our experience, getting to work hands-on with developers and having uh, worked myself as a technical assistance provider for the Great Communities Collaborative in over 23 station area plans. Um, we've daylighted a, a critical gap in, uh, especially around affordable housing and transportation data. The, the best and, and um, most up-to-date traffic models actually have a maximum of 4% trip reduction credit given to projects that are 100% affordable. And they can be extremely low income, you know, all, you know, studio, um, you know, SROs, and the maximum is 4% right now. And so knowing that, we actually just got word that Caltrans has funded um, a, a research team that we're a part of to break through that barrier because that data is, unfortunately, it's just catching up with knowing what data needs are out there and finally getting those allocated. All right, one minute. So, um, so in addition to that, we also got HUD funding through the Bayer Sustainable Communities Grant to collect parking data utilization data of what actually, how of all the parking built in a, a bunch of different projects, how much are, are people actually using those spaces? And so here's screenshots of what's to come, and I actually can do a live demo in a second. Um, but here's um, up to almost 70 projects right now, and we've got basically a map-based interface so that anyone, including you all, and I invite you all, um, we hope to launch it September 18th to the public, um, to play with this data and essentially find projects that are most similar to what you might be interested in. And the idea is that you can basically, it's a, a simple do-it-yourself parking study and comparison report. And the idea here is you can play with these different um, legends, you can see what's affordable or not, and the parking fit from high to low. And then with each project you can get uh, a little bit of uh, thumbnail information, the building info pop-up, with basic project details, um, including the parking provided and used. Um, and then here's a di the different filters, so you can use, you can pick, you know, senior projects in addition to projects with only three bedroom units to, you know, 100% market rate or mixed use. You can also look at, you know, what is the parking provided from a range of low to high parking supply, um, the percentage of, of those parking spaces used, whether it's very, very few, you know, down to just, you know, we were very surprised that there was a number of sites where half the parking was not used. Um, and there's a number of reasons there, but um, the type of parking, 
um, how what the surroundings, you know, uh, pricing and management look like by location, so by city very easily, or place type, or um, uh, priority development area for the cities, and um, in addition to these uh, traffic reduction strategies. So that's kind of what we've been calling TDMs because literally it's about for us reducing vehicle traffic and, and that's the theme of all these um, interventions. And so you can select projects by location and type of transit. And finally, um, the comparison report. So once you find those projects that are you're most interested in, you can at a glance get the summary table of just the total parking number of um, acres of unused parking, almost 200 up to 40 million, and, and actually quantifying that unused parking um, using, you know, a kind of rough ballpark of 20,000 per surface space, 40,000 for a structured space, and 80,000 for underground. And then more details again for each project type. Um, each project in here will have a detailed info sheet, and so as I mentioned, we'll release that on the 18th. Um, we plan to bring Green Trip Platinum to San Jose in, in, at the end of the year, and so that last bullet doesn't make sense because it's from another presentation, but um, <laughs> <laughs> to be continued. Um, but thank you very much. I think it's, it's a great thing. Yeah, is there any thoughts about um, instead of, um, well, maybe not instead, but you know, in addition to putting so much investment in um, transportation into areas that are all zoned for office um, to allow housing to be built and really, you know, develop multi you know, mixed use um, areas where people can live nearby where they work um, and also are able to walk to services as opposed to be able to have to be shuttled in and out, even though it's maybe not by car, but still, you know, massive influx of people in and out of an area. Actually, Sunnyvale has several areas that are that there are already plans for mixed use. We have our downtown area, and we're we're starting to see some activity going on. The former town and country um, property has been redeveloped with retail on the ground floor and residential above, um, just adjacent our office buildings. So we do get a pretty good mix in the downtown. We're working on a plan for the Lawrence Station area, which is uh, down the Caltrain line, uh, one more stop. It's a different pay zone now. And uh, <laughs> so the trick is you, you get on at one and, and you leave at the other or something. Okay. Um, and we're, we're looking at mixed, uh, like a flexible mixed use plan is what's been recommended by the committee on, on that. We're, we're in the midst of doing um, our environmental studies for that, and then we'll go back to our committee once we get preliminary environmental data. And um, we have a draft of the land use and transportation element where the uh, Horizon 2035 committee recommended a series of uh, village centers where uh, you could live, work, um, eat, um, entertain, um, so that if you chose to live without a vehicle, you would have that option. So that there are you know, little pieces. Um, there, there's a recognition that there's a huge uh, numbers of acres in the city and, and areas of the city that are single family detached homes. That's the character of those neighborhoods. So what each of these plans are doing are carving out little pieces in the community um, to provide that variety and, and really protect the single family homes um, that are enjoying a, a, a very different lifestyle. So that's, that's kind of some snapshot of some things we're doing. Uh, just uh, for Mountain View's uh, response to that question. Um, our general plan focuses a lot of our residential uh, along transit corridors along El Camino in the San Antonio area yeah, yeah. and uh, along downtown in our downtown area uh, where we have a lot of access to Caltrain, light rail, as well as um, uh, buses along El Camino. Um, in my presentation for North Bay Shore, uh, we are only looking at commercial uses uh, for a long time. Our general plan, as it was evolving, uh, strongly considered residential uses out in North Bayshore, um, but uh, it was ultimately not adopted as a part of the plan. It was going to be right in that core area, so we were going to try to create more of that village center, uh, but that is not part of the current effort. Um, uh, we'll see that that could change, but um, as of now, we're trying to wrap up the plan and, and just commercial uses in North Bayshore. Just a question, why was that not developed, that idea? 
Well, it'll be interesting to know. Sierra Club, right? Um, uh, let's see. I think um, no. that that's a key issue. Really? It is. Uh, so the, the 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 key issue from uh, the point of uh, principle is that having more things together, if you can, if at least some of the people can live near where they work and people who live or work can have stores to get to, that's a whole lot of car trips that you do not have to take. And um, this was, uh, has been a lively debate in Mountain View and uh, you know, may in the future also become a lively debate in Mountain View. So if you uh, live in Mountain View and are interested in this topic, um, do pay attention as the North Bay Shore plan uh, comes back um, uh, to see whether there is in fact uh, discussion about that topic. Um, there were some more people to... Okay. I'm wondering, uh, I didn't hear it in the presentation, but I'm wondering about the disruptive technology that might be coming our way, the self-driving cars that uh, we never read about, and they say that could even happen within the, by 2020. Uh, I, I have a vision of, of a fleet of these floating around, and, and you don't even have to own a second car, a car per town use, and, and, and that would solve the parking problem too, the cars pick somebody up, drive them, and drop them off, go pick up somebody else. They never have to park. So has, that, has that occurred? Is that part of the thinking? Just a, a random anecdote, but our Garden Village project, actually the owner of that was housing some driverless car technology in an industrial kind of uh, use before it turns into kind of four-story flats for for, resident, or for, for students, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's we're very excited about it. I think we're interested in pivoting off of peer-to-peer -peer car sharing first, kind of as a way to spread the model of of car sharing, zip car, city car share right now, they're very um, kind of conservative in where they'll serve, and so we're really excited about, especially with this new MTC call for projects um, and getting car sharing out into more suburban places, low income communities, as a way to, to transition that. But other than that, I know my mom is kind of like telling me in 10 years when those cars are out, I'm gonna take all my friends out for rides. And, um, I know she's really excited, but. <laughs> I don't think that's kind of reached or piqued the interest of um, in, in Sunnyvale. I, I'll just say generally as um, ideas and technology change, you, you have to always be open to whether or not it's going to work in your community, but not every solution is going to work in every community. Um, and I'll just take a second to, to also talk about our um, transportation demand management plans. We don't tell the, any, anybody that has a mandatory plan, we don't tell them what to include in it. We tell them what the outcome needs to be, what, how many vehicles they're allowed to have enter their property on a daily basis, and the, they need to adjust and adapt to that, so they'll have the opportunity to use new technology, perhaps in the future. Just in terms of new uh, transportation technology, at least for the North Bay Shore, uh, right now we're planning uh, the buses, uh, high-frequency buses, but we're not precluding uh, the idea that uh, future technology could be developed in that, say, main right of way, so perhaps a, a people mover or something of that nature. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, speaking of zip cars, part of the future there is already here in that we're starting to see um, uh, developments and places uh, use a zip car, use a car sharing service um, where you know you don't need if. Uh, you don't need to own a car and just use the car when you need it and when there is a, a zip car or such a car sharing that typically replaces 10 different cars that someone does not um, own or somebody does not drive to that location so that's um, a part of that future that is uh, here already um, i have a question too but yeah Um, yeah, my question, well, first of all, can we get, a, are these slides going to be available on a uh, website someplace so we can have reference to them? Um, I'm assuming that this is okay with all of our uh, presentations, and yes, and in addition to that, we have a video, so there will be video online available as well. Okay, so, um, you know, I really applaud all of your efforts um, to improve the, uh, you know, access to affordable housing and uh, green trips and all of that, uh, which is the first time I've seen a lot of this stuff. But um, really underlying, the underlying problem, uh, as I'm sure all of you realize, is that we don't have good 
uh, transit systems in this area. So a lot of this mm -hmm. is trying to work around the fact that the transit systems are really poor. And I can imagine the people that, um, you know, that, that buy these eco passes and don't have a car, mm -hmm. I mean, that's great, but it's probably going to take them two hours maybe to get to work and back. And, and you know, real, the reality is that, you know, it's really difficult to get around this area without a car. So um, how can we put pressure on the agencies um, to, you know, relevant agencies to expand BART, you know, put in, you know, trolley systems, whatever, to, um, you know, to really get people an alternative um, to their car. Because, you know, we're, I see you're trying really hard to do that in all these different ways, but a lot of the ways involve traveling on roads still. And that just means, you know, congestion. And um, so that's, that's my question. Well, if any of our other panelists don't want to um, take that also. Um, so uh, one thing to think about while there uh, definitely are significant gaps and flaws and imperfections in our Bay Area transit, um, there is a lot that can be done now. That case study with uh, Stanford showed a reduction from 72% drive alone to 42% drive alone. Unlike Facebook or Google, they are not running a private bus system to take people home. All they are doing is using the Caltrain system and running shuttle buses to take people to and from Caltrain. And um, there is a spur report showing that 80% um, of Bay Area jobs are within two to three miles of Caltrain or BART. Um, so that means that while um, you know, it's two to three miles away and you may need a shuttle trip or a bicycle to get there. If you do provide that last mile connectivity, you can, uh, you know, get a pretty uh, far distance with what we have. I think we may hear from Transform about additional opportunities for improvement. And um, everyone who is uh, signed up here um, will get more information about some opportunities that are coming up very shortly about improving aspects of our public transit system. Um, major transit investments support those and I think um, also coming up is Strategic Growth Council cap and trade revenue. I don't know if you've heard about that. Uh, fortunately transit and investment in transit capital is absolutely a top priority as well as affordable housing near transit. So so that we're, we're not just building this transit without people right next to it, we have the two coming together. And so um, it's definitely, I, I'm so proud to work with my colleagues at uh, Transform, the other side of the house that's doing all the transit supply work and really watchdogging MTC and your congestion management agencies and sales tax uh, work. I'd also add real quick, a, a fun case study is City of Walnut Creek has been doing parking benefit districts, essentially market-based metered pricing and they've changed their rates twice now actually that's the last time i saw tara was that one of these talks about um uh, pricing and uh, demand-based pricing and how you take that on-street pricing to manage how people are getting around in a downtown corridor or even kind of mystic mixed use districts and walnut creek has changed the rates twice now with no protests from their downtown and as a result their revenues has has resulted in doubling the free transit shuttle downtown. So doubling the length of that route. So I, I see that as a very, very exciting future. Anita, do you want to mention the North South study too? Just um, yeah, so um, here in uh, Sunnydale, um, we're about to see information about two projects where I suspect that um, both of them together would be better than either one of them separately. Um, the bus rapid transit for El Camino Real, where there'll be a talk here on September 11th. And then also VTA is doing a, a north-south study. So if you have a combination of north-south buses and east-west buses, where the east-west gets faster and maybe the north-south gets more frequent, um, all of a sudden that could potentially make it a lot more practical to get to where you're going in transit. Um, so I'll, I'll, yes, I'll watch for that. There was any information about how many trips fewer you get by having childcare for really young kids located in high density residential areas versus having the employment centers. Does anybody know?
a very specific, um, uh, very good question, but also very specific. And so right now, the data, the sophistication of the data collection uh, in terms of affordable housing. So right now, we got Caltrans to add on not just looking at housing in smart growth, kind of dense, infill, kind of easily walkable places with lots of transit, but we're adding, getting them to think about just the depth of affordability and tra traffic reduction strategies. I think um, things like childcare, it makes a lot of sense, and I think we we're, eventually we'll get there, but starting with the kind of obvious ones, like if you've got transit passes on site, if you've got free car sharing, Eventually, once we document those and the actual trip reduction credit a trip that can be attributed to increased affordability and all these different measures, and cumulatively, I think we'll start to see all of that correlated as well. So, so I guess in a way, by um, by default, because when we work with the the researchers at the academics, the academians, um, they will. Um, be able to correlate, you know, if there is childcare in the ground floor, if there's a mix of uses in the ground floor of a building, um, eventually we can figure that out, tease that out. But it's very complex, as you can see, when you have a project that's got a whole bunch of things bundled together, what is, what can you attribute directly to one thing or another? It starts to get very uh, com complicated, so. Okay, and I want to just um, toss in one more thing on top of what you said in the previous, and then uh, 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 hand it to uh, Wendy, who also has a uh, question. Um, you mentioned Walnut Creek um, doing uh, demand-based uh, pricing. That's pricing parking at a level where that will leave parking places free and reduce traffic from people cruising around looking for parking. Um, the next stage in there is something that the city of San Mateo has just started to do, building on a great example in Boulder, which is actually taking the revenue from their parking meters downtown and using them not just to build the next parking garages, which is pretty familiar, but using them for programs like zip cars and transit passes to reduce driving and reduce the need to have to build those more parking garages. So that's another um, innovative strategy we're starting to see in our area. Um, Wendy, you had a question? Yeah, okay, sure. I know. Um, so I heard two groups mentioned. One is um, under the federal stuff, you can get housing. And one is Google people. But we know that if you create one Google job, there's four support jobs who likely don't make Google levels of money. And so that puts a majority of us who, you know, we can't get on it, we can't get the eco pass. That's a majority of people who are driving because what options? I'd love to hear the solution to that. No, oh, and I should say I live in a 60-year-old building. Right? They're not gonna give me benefits. <laughs> and I'm sorry, you're gonna hear me run back and grab something. But I'll, I'll hear you guys. <laughs> okay, um, I'll do one and maybe more other speakers, uh, maybe more. Um, the transportation demand management, the, the flow has been from the big employers to new areas, and then the step from that might be to existing areas and neighborhoods. The city of Boulder has a neighborhood eco-pass where they give those discount transit passes not just to a new building, but to a neighborhood, and neighborhoods that have a neighborhood eco-pass, people who live there drive 40% less than your average person in Boulder. Um, so that is a direction that the, Bay, that the Bay Area and our transit agencies could go in and somebody asked about how do we get the transit system to serve us better. That's one opportunity where we can encourage the transit system to serve us better and do that. Uh, just a couple comments from Mount View. Um, uh, Google uh, you know, has announced that uh, they will be uh, establishing a free community shuttle to route through different parts of the Mountain View neighborhood. That's one thing. The other thing is uh, the new bus service that I showed going from the downtown Caltrain up to North Bayshore uh, that's all going to be publicly accessible. I, I live near Rainstorm and El Camino. That, that's a mile from my house. So, it, you know, and, and that is where the majority of people in Mountain View do live, actually. So, so I, you know, not, not taking any particular situation, and, and I'm not at all the expert on, on this, but there are general organizations that, that individuals can go. 511.org, gee, I'm looking for someone to ride share with, or, you know, I'm, uh, in, so there are some other resources that are that are out there, so you don't have to live in the right place or work for the right company. Um, you might just, you know, 
beside you tired driving or something. Or you, you know, you can car share with someone in, in a commute sense that one day you drive, they, they drive. So the, I think there are other options. Ryan, Ms. Ryan, when is Peary Park going to be addressed? We have building going on over there, and all I keep hearing about is Moffat Business Park. Earlier, I answered the question about mixed use. Um, Moffat Park, as you, as you mentioned, is already uh, an area that has a plan. We're currently working on the Perry Park specific plan. Uh, several of our, of our plans uh, were delayed or held up, if you will, um, because of the traffic studies, of all things. Um, trying to get, make sure that we, we got complete and accurate information. And also, as you want to peel the onion and, and start to discover what the traffic patterns are, it starts to suggest you may need to do different things um, in your community. Uh, so the Peer Park specific plan is, is in progress and um, is expected to um, have some new uh, additional community workshops in uh, the early part of 2015, the December, December to January. We, we haven't really given the dates yet, so I would say figure on the January. Um, and um, we'll try to advertise that pretty widely because we know there are a lot of people that are you know, interested in it. Uh, the council has asked us uh, to concentrate on employment uses in the Peary Park, with the exception of the areas um, on the east side of Matilda where they said they'd be willing to consider residential there. So I would say middle of next year before that plan is completed. Are we going to use uh, a little bit more high tech than someone standing on a panel with a camera? For what? To count cars. Um, there are a number of different That's techniques what was used, used on Pastoria and Lot. So, I mean, if you're going to state state, there are a lot of different ways. ways. Yeah, there are a lot of different ways to count traffic. Okay. Um, uh, one last question, and then the panelists will um, stay here and, and uh, take. Uh, I'll write. Yeah. Um, can, can you? Quick, I don't need the microphone. I just wanted to say that none, none of this has brought up the fact that the school districts have completely abdicated any responsibility for getting children to school. So, my, I'm fortunate to live near the. 53 BTA bus line when my daughter just started sixth grade at Sunnyvale Middle. But there's a whole swath of um, Hollenbeck, and those kids have quite a bit of ways. If you, you know, live at like Hollenbeck and uh, you know, just south of El Camino, that kid's got to walk you know, all the way to Sunnyvale. There's no, there's no bus transit option for that, for that student. And so you end up with you know, uh, you know, 500 cars trying to go to Sunnyvale Middle. And then there's all the elementary schools, of course, that those kids can't walk in. Um, thank you. And um, um, panelists, um, comments about uh, transportation to school, safe routes to school programs. You know, bike polling, car polling. Can, can I add to that also? Um, the schools are so impacted as it is right now. Uh, the, the, uh, I heard um, that my children are beyond elementary school now, but. But I heard in our elementary school, they eliminated balls because it was too dangerous because it, there's so many kids on the top, on the there. They keep adding, building more buildings, but that takes away from the playground. And they, I mean, they, they've already, um, um, you know, you know, sectioned, okay, in, these grades can have recess now, and then when they go back in, now this, this other grade comes out, you know, yeah, and that, that's, that is, um, de 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 that's definitely an issue and a topic of concern and the relationship between development and schools. Um, that may be something to address at a later agenda item that I think our folks maybe are not, we may not have the right set of experts to talk about that, but that is an important uh, uh, topic. And um, uh, so with that, I'd like to really uh, thank the uh, panelists who come to uh, talk. Thank you very much.